so as mentioned, I'm Gareth Rushgrove uh, from the UK, hence the accent. Uh, I work at a security company making developer tools called Snick. Um, I contribute to a bunch of open source projects, and I'm more obviously going to be talking about that here today. Um, I want to take a step back from the over long title and talk a little bit about what we mean by policy in the context of software development. Um, I want to introduce Open Policy Agent and some tools from that ecosystem, and then really dive into an example, like looking at where it's useful and how we can do so, like test policy and make policy assertions throughout our pipeline. So, what, what do we mean by policy? Um, always like a dictionary definition to kick things off. Um, a set of ideas or a plan of what to do in a particular situation that has been agreed to officially by a group of people, a business organization, government, or political party. Um, obviously, here we're mainly talking about maybe the more senior people in your organization going into a room and deciding on certain things that you, you do or don't do. So maybe it's that someone has now mandated all, all of your Go projects should be using a specific version of Go. Again, applicable to all sorts of other different languages and frameworks. Maybe it's that the lawyers are involved and all the open source projects should all use the specific, uh, the same license. If you're releasing code under, under an open source project, you've decided that it has to be this license. Or maybe it's more specific. Maybe it's about all of those Docker files you're creating or other assets you're creating and you have some rules about them. Um, you have to, all Docker files should have a maintainer label. We don't use latest tags, whatever it might be. So if that's the sort of working definition of policy, at least for the next half an hour, um, how might we choose to enforce that in our software pipelines? Um, the why there is really that Scaling policy enforcement, where it is that sort of, some people hopefully haven't gone into a smoke-filled room, but might have done, come up with these rules, and then written them in a word, a word document, and then put it on SharePoint, and like, yep, we're all good now. All of those things are true. That doesn't work. Ultimately, people don't find it. People don't believe it. People don't pay attention to it. People um, appreciate that it's probably out of date, like maintaining that as a sort of static thing that's manually enforced, really just leads to the stress of often people on the security side or compliance side running around your organization, like trying to play whack-a-mole. Not because people are doing the wrong things on purpose, but because it's hard, hard to ultimately scale processes built on people. So how can we automate that? Well, if this is a sort of our very simplified model of our process pipeline application lifecycle. Um, really just for the purposes of this talk. Again, you'll, you'll probably be more complex, but generalizing. An important thing to note here is feedback. Like, it's not just enough to know the current state of, okay, yep. We need to know that all, like 10% of our Go projects are not on the correct version. But how do we actually fix that? Like, just reporting it isn't probably good enough. The reality is that we need feedback, often to developers, to resolve those things. Testing earlier is faster feedback, but maybe not complete. You're not going to see everything. Testing later, like, this is maybe where you're running everything. This is the stuff you care about most. But it's slower feedback. And we'll come back to why that's sort of interesting uh, a bit later on. So. Um, who's come across Open Policy Agent? Uh, lots of hands. Who's using it? Fewer hands. That's what I thought. Um, so, what is Open Policy Agent? So, I like to think of it as, as an open source policy engine. So, it's an open source project. It's part of the CNCF, um, sort of family of uh, projects now. Um, and it's an engine for making policy decisions. Ultimately, you've probably built sort of hard-coded versions of sort of policy engines in your code before. OPA just solves all the same problems in a generalized way. Uh, you can use it as a library in Go. You can run it as a service. 
And ultimately, you, you give it some policy, um, and that, written in a language called Rego, and I'll show some examples of that. And you give it some data, and it gives you back the, like, the answers to, like, well, actually, what happened when we, inf we applied that policy to that data. Um, it's also a really nice, like, friendly open source community. Uh, there's a sensible Slack channel. There's a, uh, a whole bunch of nice folks around. Um, or as uh, Vincent described it, it's my new favorite hammer. Uh, turns out, you, because it's very general, you can apply it to all sorts of different pro problems. So here's a quick example. Uh, let's say that we're having a conversation about the rest, like where we're going to go for food this evening. Um, and because we're at a software conference, we've decided to collect that list in a JSON document. Uh, like, bear with me. Um, so, well, we've got a data structure. We've, we've listed some restaurants that we could go to. Um, maybe different people have suggested different ones. But I've got some opinions about where we might eat. And realistically, I can't bear unlimited breadsticks. It's just, it's not good. So I'm setting a policy which says here, well, if it, like, we will basically fail, we will say that, nope, we're out of policy if Olive Garden is in that list. Um, totally unfair, um, but uh, an example of the type of thing you can do. So this is Rego. This is the policy language, the DSL that we're using to make these assertions. So obviously, Making uh, decisions about where we go to eat or don't go to eat is probably not a super strong use case. Um, Open Policy Agent is integrated into all sorts of different services, and this list keeps growing. So it, it's integrated into uh, Istio and Ceph and Gatekeeper, which I'll come on to later. Um, because there's lots of services where you want to make policy decisions, and Open gives you a really powerful tool to do so. And there's advantages to being able to describe your policies for different things in the same language. It's quite commonly used, actually, in the Kubernetes space at the moment. Uh, there's a strong like, link between the two areas. It's mainly used over here. So it's mainly used in our sort of simplified model in production, in, your, in Kubernetes clusters, often as part of an emission controller. And we'll come on to an example of that later with Gatekeeper. But mainly over here, what we said before was actually, and this is great for and compliance and sort of completeness, but not great for fast feedback. So uh, going back sort of a little while ago, I was sort of super interested in open source agent, but I was more interested in that side of things. I was more like, well, how can we get the power of policy into developers' hands? So. Uh, I had some time on my hands somehow, and uh, took Open Policy Agent and wrote uh, ConfTest. So I did a talk just introducing ConfTest at, in Barcelona. Um, so this is built on top of Open Policy Agent. Open Policy Agent does all the hard work. ConfTest provides a, a developer-focused user experience and user interface on top of that. Um, so it's still a general purpose tool, but it has a very specific use case, really around testing. So it's much more like more of a local testing tool or a tool for CI integration. And it has a whole bunch of things that just make it easier to solve those types of problems. So Open Policy Agent really cares about data. Well, ConfTest basically says, I know about all the data formats you're using. Just give me them, and I'll sort it out. So it supports JSON and YAML and INI and HCL and TOML and Q and Dockerfile and probably some others at this point. Um, so give it your config files and some policy, and we can make assertions on that. It also has some built-in tools to, for sharing uh, and like sort of developer-friendly output. So for our example previously, let's say that uh, our list of restaurants was in res restaurants.json. Um, Restaurants.rego is the Rego file we looked at, and we can just run conf test test, point it at those things, and we'll get some hopefully useful output. Whereas OPERA is sort of integrated into, I guess, the more server-side services. 
ConfTest basically then ends up integrated into various developer tools. So there's GitHub Actions, there's Tekton Tasks, there's a Circle CI orb that was contributed by a, uh, someone who was using Circle and came along and joined the project. So that's, that's the sort of components parts that I'm gonna use to sort of build out this pipeline. But let's jump into an actual example. Uh, I'm go I, because I wanted to make this like a bit more real, I, I'm picking a specific project. That means I needed to pick a, a language. I've picked Python, because uh, I like Python. But this is totally applicable to anything. The, real, the reality is if you've got some other language or framework, you're gonna have some config files. You know what they are. Um, so don't worry about the Python-specific bits. You've probably got some config file in your repo for everything. So one of the things that uh, a Python project often has is, uh, well, there's a number of different alternatives, but pip file is one of them. Uh, for describing or defining the dependencies of the project, so which packages am I using in my Python project? So this might, in Java, you might have a pom.xml file or a Gradle file. In Ruby, it might be a gem file. In node, project.json. All of those files are configuration. And well, in my organization, or my hypothetical organization, we've got some rules around those. Um, in one case, well, we should be on Python 3. Um, because, well, actually, Python 2 is a uh, end of life. So that's definitely something where organizations would say it. This is us in describing it in code. Um, also, we should be using SSL. So simple assertions about things that you could like, have a conversation about now encoded in, uh, described in code. So let's have a look what that might look like. Hopefully that's big enough. So I'm in the repo with a load of these config files. So conf test, oh, I can spell, test. Um, so I'm gonna run conf test, test. I'm gonna tell, tell conf test that this is toml. Um, pip file doesn't have an extension, it's not, uh, not easy to auto discover that. So basically we're being explicit in this case. And namespace is me saying, use the policies related to pip file. And, we'll, uh, and pip file is the actual file. So I can run that, and lo and behold, we fail. Uh, if I change my toml file, obviously, again, uh, don't worry too much about the specifics. And rerun, obviously, like, I've started to solve problems. Um, like that was something that I just ran in my project that was generic to my organization. My project had a problem, I was able to fix it. And obviously we could fix the other one as well. Um, so pretty simple, but and in this particular project, there's actually quite a few different config files. There's a PyTest file, um, there's some Kubernetes configs, there's a Docker file. Well, using the same tooling, we can test uh, let's do we can test our PyTest file. Um, and you'll note there that we've got instead of hard failures, like instead of exiting with a non-zero exit code and giving you red flashing failures, we're saying, well, actually, there are some things where it, it's a strong hint, but eh, we'll probably let you off most of the time. Maybe these become hard failures in the future. So with ConfTest, you can uh, issue warnings as well. And the other thing here is um, you start going, well, OK, but how do I know my policies work? Um, I'm using this tool, and I've written some Rego code. But how do I know the Rego code doesn't have bugs? Um, well, turns out Open Policy Agent has a unit testing framework um, because it is a developer tool. So let's have a look at some tests. And again, this is Rego code testing the, pol the, the policies we wrote. So um, again, here we're saying, well, we should deny, we, it, it should fail um, if the input is this. So we're able to write tests for our policies and then use those policies with a lot more confidence. 
Um, and ConfTest makes it really easy to just run those tests uh, with ConfTest Verify. So that will run all the unit tests for your policies so you have some confidence that, like, if someone says, well, yeah, like, but you've had to take that Word document and you've turned it into code. Machines are good at doing the wrong thing if you've told them to do. Well, we can solve that with testing. We do that everywhere else. We can do it here with uh, Open Policy Agent. So I, I mentioned a few of these examples, but you never know if demos are not going to work. Um, again, think of all those configuration files that you have in your repos that scatter around. Think of all the things that you know are the right thing to do, but you probably don't know whether you do them everywhere. Um, suddenly, you've got a, a very general purpose tool that can take any of those input formats and start reasoning about them. Uh, Confidence also, and this is sort of a new thing, uh, actually has a Python library as well. So if someone's like, oh, I don't want another tool. I already have a testing tool. I'm already writing my tests. Um, you can actually just use uh, Confidence as a library um, in, uh, in hit, well, basically in Python, but here in uh, PyUnit tests. Um, maybe other people will build a sort of plugin for other things. You're still writing your tests in Rego, but your test runner is now the thing you're already running in your CI system, which can be, have some nice properties. So um, we're at KubeCon, so talking about how that applies to Kubernetes is sort of interesting. Um, turns out we definitely have config in Kubernetes. Uh, there's quite a lot of it. Like, I, like, turns out that there's probably close to 2 million like, individual files probably on GitHub that are sort of Kubernetes shaped. Um, that's public ones. Uh, how many there are worldwide for everywhere else is a point of speculation, but it's not a small number. Um, we definitely have a lot of config. Um, and there are definitely best practices, issues, like things you can do right or wrong. Um, we're at quite a low level of abstraction for the most part there. Uh, Shout out to some prior art, the KubeSec project did a really good job of sort of going through and coming up with some best practices around uh, this y useful one-shot tool. Um, uh, one of the things we've been doing is sort of taking those rules and encoding them in Rego. Um, again, actually, you're sort of building the same thing there. It's just that you can be then adding your own rules becomes easier. Having rules that are you don't like, like, maybe you don't like one of the, the rules there. Maybe you want something to be more important or something slightly different. Obviously, having a general purpose tool and, and the language around it makes that possible. But there's definitely space for like, point and shoot specific tools and general ones, in my opinion. So we've been porting a bunch of the kubesec rules to, to Rego. Um, another thing that crops up uh, uh, around Kubernetes configuration, especially in the security space and sort of best practice areas, is being pod security policies. Um, there are some pros and cons around uh, that. There's a session on the, with SIGOF on Thursday, I think, talking about that. But there's actually uh, been some work uh, with uh, Rita from uh, Microsoft, who uh, is one of the leads on the Gatekeeper project, to port pod security policies to Rego. And again, making it much more flexible and easy to sort of evolve and change outside a big Kubernetes release. So. Probably not good. Uh, I'll come back to that. Um, there's the Helm plugin as well. So, like, again, I'm trying to integrate this into like, the tools people are using to make it as easy as possible. Like, Helm is a good example of where people are packaging up their Kubernetes config. Well, does that look good? Does that work? Is it secure? Um, so, the Helm plugin basically just allows you to run Helm conf test. That will take the values, that will take the templates, that will put it all together and apply the policy on that. So you don't have to, or you could sort of do, uh, Confidence can take things on standard in, so you could pipe Helm template in. Well, the Helm plugin basically just abstracts you away from that. So with Confidence, we've got a local set of tooling that we can use to write policy for all sorts of structured data. Um, any of those config files and, uh, that you have lying around, we can now with the same tool set and the same language write policy about. So that's powerful, that's useful. And again, like, that's really good for local fast feedback. So how do we start getting that into a CI system? Because we want to enforce that as well. Uh, so, and this is the sort of model I've been using. 
really, well, make sure our policy adheres to the unit test. If it doesn't, applying our policy is a bad thing to do. Um, if it does, well, we can just paralyze all of these things. So running our pip file, running our Docker file through, running the Helm chart through, this is running our PyTest. Like, this is a real project with real world config. We can apply all sorts of things. Uh, obviously, there are loads of different CI systems, and people are using different ones. Um, so I, more for, like, because I like it. I, I've been playing with Tekton uh, here um, as a sort of interesting model of config. Um, note that uh, whether it's Tekton or Circle or Jenkins or whatever, a lot of these are actually configured by data. And you might have policies about your CI configuration that are tested in your CI configuration. So like, you can get quite meta with this stuff pretty quickly, um, especially when you think about you're writing unit tests for your policy in Rego, and you're potentially then running them in the Python unit tests. You can get quite meta. It, it makes it quite powerful. So let's say we, we can start a pipeline in Tekton. We can run that, we, and we can see the outputs as well. I, and again, let's have a look at what that looks like in the Tekton dashboard. And again, obviously, your CI tool of choice will have something very similar um, where we can see the results of that policy being constantly applied. Um, so in this case, well, yeah, I, I, I had a very poorly configured Helm chart, and it's been caught in CI. And now I need to go fix those before my Helm chart can get deployed. Um, again, you, like, this is just another thing you, that can be added into your CI system. You're still doing your unit tests. You're still doing your integration tests. You're still writing. Out testing everything else this is another area that you can sort of test, often very quickly because for the most part you're like you're not having to write policies per project. Your policies are more general. They're possibly even for this entire community. Um, so there's not the I need to write all the policies. Often it's about reusing. Um, it's also generally speaking very fast to run. So you're not talking about something that's going to be hugely slowing down your. Uh, pipelines. So we've got a tool set that can be used locally. We've got a tool set that, that, that is useful in CI where we can sort of do some enforcement. And so we start getting into production. Um, this is where Gatekeeper comes in. Like, Confess is focused on that developer problem in the CI space. Gatekeeper is focused very squarely on making open policy agent uh, useful in a Kubernetes context. Um, so how it does this is basically allows you to uh, it, well, add some controllers to Kubernetes and then some, uh, some custom resources. And you can describe constraints and constraint templates. Um, off the bottom here, just a bit, is actually a whole bunch of Rego. So the language we were using for a policy agent can be basically packaged into Kubernetes resources and uploaded to your cluster. And Gatekeeper then acts as a, uh, an admission controller and uh, Webhook can basically enforces that. We'll, we'll show that in a second. Um, that does get into the, uh, j because you've got the sort of policy written in Rego and you want to write the tests with that and the tool set is built around that, you end up wanting to then package that up into uh, basically these constraint documents, the YAML documents that you send off. There's a few like tools starting to emerge in this area. Um, this, it's still a bit often manual in a lot of places. Um, I've written a really uh, opinionated tool that allows me to just go like, point it at a Rego file, and it will generate me a constraint template with some assumptions. Uh, and actually, I run this in GitHub Actions. So I've basically got a, a, a repo of a load of Rego files. And whenever I change those, an action kicks in and basically regenerates my constraint templates. So I'm not having to manage multiple things. I, can, I, I just have one set of policies that I can check out the repo and run, that run in my CI, and also then get built into constraint templates that, I, that can be then deployed to Kubernetes. So manage one set of policies that can be used throughout the, the process. Um, GitHub Actions is really nice for like ad hoc automation, like this sort of stuff. So let's have a look at what that actually means. I'll jump to the demo because it's easier to see. So, yep. uh, 
I've all I've got a Kubernetes cluster running. I've got Gatekeeper installed. I've I've already at, like uploaded my policies. Um, let's have a look. Oh, actually, I think it's. So yeah, th so here you can see all of that Rego being put into a Kubernetes shaped object. Again, this is also generated. I don't write this by hand um, to make it a, a little bit easier. Uh, I've got a couple of namespaces set up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, try and just send this deployment off to Kubernetes to deploy it. The deployment is very simple, straight up like basic hello world example. Um, and I've tried to deploy it, but this cluster is, this namespace is configured with those constraints and Kubernetes says no. Kubernetes says, well, wait a minute, no, like the policy says you can't have this configured like this and I've just blocked you. I'm not allowed to deploy that deployment. Kubernetes at an early stage, like at the API level, just said, no, not having that. Um, so that's useful. It also might be, if, if you turn up to uh, at your work and you've written a lot of policy and you upload it to Gatekeeper and now everything is blocked, that's probably not the best idea. Like basically everyone will come and kill you is the short version of how that ends. Like the, you, like so Gatekeeper also allows you basically to audit um, I can't remember the entire command, so I've got a handy make file. Uh, so here, we're actually looking at, we're, we've basically just run uh, kubectl get on the, uh, the, the custom resource that was created by Gatekeeper. Um, and you can see a bunch of metadata, but then in the status, we have all of the violations of this policy. So actually, if I try and deploy this to that, if I, if I try and deploy my deployment to the audit namespace, it gets deployed. But I have a, a, a way of asking Kubernetes which things in that namespace are out of policy. And obviously, I can then use this to go, OK, yep, let's go fix those problems. Let's work with teams. Let's get that into their CI systems. And then at some point, this will be a list of zero, and then we can enforce it. And once we're enforcing, we ha like, we're checking in our, we're, we're giving tools to developers so they can very easily verify that. It's not like coming in late and saying security says no. Like, it's in their CI systems. And if anyone says, like, well, I'm just going to bypass CI and I'm just going to run a command against the cluster, well, the cluster will protect itself. Um, so you can build uh, a really a sort of developer-friendly but controlling workflow using the open policy agent tool set. So if all you take away from this is local development is important, especially when it comes to things that are potentially going to slow you down. Like make adopting good practice easy and people will do so. Uh, do it in smokeful rooms with documents and it just doesn't scale. Like enforcement and continuous integration is where developers get feedback. Like, so it's the logical place to introduce other types of feedback like policy. And then you probably still want to get your clusters and have tools that allow you auditing properties because that's where you're actually running the things that you want the policies to enforce. So a few takeaways. Um, open source is pretty great. Uh, open Policy Agent is a, a really interesting low-level project that can be used for all sorts of different use cases. Um, and it made making contests really easy. Um, and Comtis then went from me hacking on something uh, to now six like maintainers and a whole bunch of people contributing more than I am now. Um, and it's been used in a bunch of places six months later, which is nice. Um, they make a really good toolkit. Um, again, I've taken a certain opinionated uh, sort of flow for that workflow. But that's not the tools. That's me. You could do some of it, all of it, or something completely different. They're really powerful general purpose tools. There's a lot of room to build, actually, other projects potentially on top that are more opinionated. Um, and the last thing is sharing. Like, a lot of these policies are general. They're not just for me. They're not just for my projects. 
They're things that actually as a community, especially in the Kubernetes space, we can probably all agree on a good set of best practices. And getting those into code and into the tooling would be really nice. So I think sharing is really the next step for me for the uh, sort of open policy agent project. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much. Hopefully it's been of interest. And yeah, come say hi on the booth. So any questions in the audience? Hey, Gareth, thank you for that. Uh, so I'm a little confused about the, the difference between ConfTest and gate, Gatekeeper, is it? In, in terms of the configuration, so it sounds like you're, you've written a tool that ports the ConfTest configuration over. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so uh, ConfTest just deals with Rego. Um, uh, Gatekeeper basically takes Rego and packages it up for Kubernetes so you can send it to the Kubernetes API. So it's just a wrapper around the Rego in YAML to go to the to basically talk to the Kubernetes API. Um, so like you can do that by hand, and I've just written a tool that makes it easier for me to, to reuse the same Rego in both Gatekeeper and in Confest. So it seems you'd want to do that. So I guess my, my second kind of question was, why not just use ConfTest for both? Um, it's a purely a user experience thing. ConfTest is, is a CLI tool um, that's used locally. Gatekeeper basically is a controller that runs in your cluster. Um, mo all of the policy enforcement bits are in Open Policy Agent. So they're really all about just making user experiences on top. Hi, yeah, so question, do you know how OPA will help with things like um, AWS policies specifically? Like, are you able to integrate the policies from OPA with like IAM role policies or something like that? Uh, so yeah, the question there is around like AWS specific use cases. Um, again, like cloud providers, like if you're configuring anything like that, has loads of config. Mm -hmm. um, let's say you're using Terraform or you're using CloudFormation. Mm -hmm. um, they're just, from the point of view of Confess, they're just data structures. Mm -hmm. And so you can absolutely use Rego and, and Confess to test those. Um, there's a little bit less prior art um, in terms of their big API services and less people are doing so, but there are some people writing uh, policies mainly internally in organizations for those things. Mm -hmm. um, there are some examples in the Confess repo of like serverless framework as well, and there are some AWS examples, but only a few. Um, SAM as well is another example of all of these, it's just data from the point of view of these tools. There's nothing Kubernetes specific in Contest at all. Mm -hmm. It's in the policies you write and the rego you write that you start adding the domains. So yeah, I'd love to see a, like a shared library of AWS policy stuff. I think it would be great. Okay, cool. In your examples, you mentioned uh, GitHub Actions. But what if somebody were using GitHub Enterprise where actions don't exist yet? So can we still use OPA there? Oh, absolutely. The, and the, the, the GitHub Actions part is purely as a helper for generating some files that I didn't want to manually transpose. Um, but actually, most people today are, manu are either manually transposing them or have, like, if you've got a CI pipeline, you could do that auto generation there. It's purely an implementation detail, certainly not required by any of the tooling along the chain. Thanks for the talk. So you were mentioning um, that you can use various different sources to bring in uh, rules via Rego, right? Um, so what kind of package management kind of currently exists for this, and like, yep. what does the discoverability look like for these yep. things? So. Uh, Discoverability and sharing are super interesting but very new. Um, there's some tooling in ConfTest that allows you to share uh, basically bun OPA bundles, which include the Rego and some data and some metadata, um, uh, using an OCI registry. Um, it uses the new uh, OCI artifact spec, um, which isn't implemented everywhere. So actually, this currently only works in Azure and in the uh, Docker distribution open source project. Um, there's some new functionality that's been added, uh, I haven't had a chance to look at it probably yet, uh, by some of the other maintainers that actually ma makes sharing via S3 possible, sharing via actually Git repos possible. So you basically have a push and pull uh, commands uh, for pushing and pulling things. So I can push something up and you can pull it down. Uh, so early days with that, 
and in, there is actually a conf test, like config file, where you can describe uh, some of these sources. It's not all fully baked yet, um, but, and there's a question over how much of a package manager we want to build. Also, at the moment, that's really incubating within the conf test project. Um, might be interesting to pull that out at some point and make it more generically useful for the rest of the OPA uh, ecosystem. Um, some conversations there, but we've not done anything there yet. Hi. Uh, very new to OPA, but why Rego? Uh, I guess would be one first question. Uh, so, yeah, why Rego? I, I mean, ultimately, more of a sort of OPA question. Um, uh, so the OPA sort of maintainers are a good start. It's really that's what they started with. Um, they're like, uh, Rich will appreciate this, but like you, DSLs have a lot of power and potentially high barrier to entry. Um, some people absolutely hate DSLs. Other people are like, ooh, I, like, I want DSLs for everything. Um, there are definitely downsides with Rego, just as a high barrier to entry, it's a new thing to learn. Um, but it's specifically designed for this purpose. It does this like policy assertions really, really well. I, yes, you could sort of write assertions in a general purpose language, but the, the, the types of bugs you get are sort of more general as well. Um, yeah. So it, it's, uh, it's an implementation that... detail of, of open policy agent, which is the thing that Gatekeeper and Confess are built on top of. Right. OK, thanks. Yeah. Is there any interest from any group to generalize these Rego files for what best practices that are needed for production grade Kubernetes, right? Uh, so, yep. so that we can integrate. Our so, look yeah, at yes, uh, is the short version. We, like, and there's definitely a few people who are like a bunch of these policies, like pod security policies, is a good example, where we just want to someone in the community can write them and everyone can benefit. Um, that definitely feels like it's the direction of travel. There's not a concerted effort yet. Um, there are a few of us who keep writing like bigger things and sharing them. Um, that's why I think the sharing tools are important. There's, there were some conversations at the SIG security event yesterday about um, there's the newly launched Security Hub project. Um, and we might look at being able to use Security Hub as a way of sharing like good, like, so if there's a good security config for Kubernetes, can we share it on Security Hub? Um, currently, it's mainly used for sharing Falco rules, but sharing Rego would make a really nice next step. Uh, so early, as, but definitely interest, definitely conversations. Um, so if I, want, today if I want to go somewhere, like is, is those, some of those examples that you did, is it shared in some place in the GitHub that we can pull? Yep. Yeah, I, at the moment, the, most of the things are scattered in GitHub repos. Uh, I think Re, uh, Rita I mentioned from the Gatekeeper project has got a bunch of stuff. The, all of the code I showed is on my, my GitHub under Gareth R. Um, I'll include a link in the uh, sort of roundup. Um, yeah, I, uh, the best bet at the moment is jump onto the Open Policy Agent Slack and ask and there are a bunch of examples floating around. We, we, as a community, we need to get better at putting that all in one place and sort of working on it together. What are the oh, uh, sneak! I just I work there. Oh. Um, if you want to see what we do, though, all of that's very cool, and you should come to that booth. Uh, where we provide de ultimately developer-focused security tooling. Um, so this is definitely of interest, and we're doing some config stuff. But I, I, I have like three jobs. It's Confusing. So, yeah, thanks for all the questions and coming along. <laughs>